It is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ira Blaus Blotstein, I'm sorry, uh, whose uh, keynote address will be strategic planning for the second half of your life. Dr. Blotstein teaches courses in strategic planning, change management and leadership, as well as consulting on strategic planning and national security issues relating to his Department of Defense experience. He is the recipient of several awards, including two uh, U.S. Government Senior Executive Service Awards, uh, a, a Presidential Rank Meritorious Award, and a Presidential Rank Distinguished Award. Uh, he joined uh, the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory in 1999 and later became Director of Strategic Planning. In 2009, he accepted a full-time position as Assistant Professor in the Division of Public Safety Leadership. Previously, Dr. Blotstein was selected as the first Technical Director of the, uh, the US Army's, USA's Naval Surface Warfare Center. Uh, and uh, before he was head of the engineering department at NSWC, then deputy technical director. Uh, Dr. Blotstein has performed and led research in underwater explosion effects and explosion acoustics at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, and he began his management career as the head of explosion effects branch, uh, and then became head of the radiation uh, division. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Blotstein and uh, One of my observations is how often my name is misspelled or mispronounced. So uh, you're in good company. Um, I've been uh, doing and teaching strategic planning for too many years to count at this point. Uh, for about 15 years, uh, I did strategic planning at the Applied Physics Laboratory and other organizations. Uh, and then I started teaching it at Johns Hopkins. And I tell my students that I'm qualified uh, to teach strategic planning because I've made almost every mistake that you can make uh, doing it. Um, early on, my focus was on organizations and how they did strategic planning. Trying to, oh, I guess I ought to bring this thing up, right? First steps first. Uh, okay. Bum, bum, bum. If I hit all the buttons on here, eventually. Well, I can't seem to, uh, page down. well, I'm trying page down. Got it. Well, uh, there's an X, so if we do that. So let's see which button actually works. Okay, now I got it working. Um, early on, my focus was on organizational strategic planning. And then as I began to teach more students and see more response, my uh, focus shifted a bit to uh, personal strategic planning. Uh, and after teaching students for five or six years and collecting probably uh, six or 700 of them, I did a survey to see what effect that this strategic planning uh, coursework had done to them, what the impact was. So I'm going to walk you through all of that re relatively quickly. First talk about strategic planning and then organizational strategic planning and then student personal strategic planning and again a survey. How does that planning affect people? So here's the uh, a, pri a primer on uh, strategic planning. Uh, if you're doing any planning, you ought to be answering three questions. Who are we? Where do we want to go? And how can we get there? I mean, there's lots of different ways to do it, but you have to be answering these three questions. And, and they're not, 
They're easy to state. They're very difficult to answer completely. Strategic planning is structured common sense. I mean, when you look at the different approaches, you're really working your way through different approaches to get to the answer of where do I want to go, to have a vision. Um, but it all is kind of common sense when you look at it. It really isn't only or so much about the strategic plan itself. Strategic planning makes you intellectually alert, so you recognize the future as it whizzes by. I mean, things are happening all the time, and if you have some idea of what your interests are, what your plan is, then as something happens, you can recognize it as an opportunity. You can seize it. Uh, whereas if you haven't really thought about the future or what you're interested in, then everything kind of goes by in a blur. So one of the keys of strategic planning is it makes you intellectually alert. A strategic planning is a vector. Uh, what's really important is that it gives a direction to you as an individual or to an organization. Um, it's a way of communicating to everybody else around you where the organization wants to go. Uh, I often describe my experience as a line manager uh, that about 90% of the time, the people who are working for you are somewhere else doing something else. And so you have no visibility as to what they're doing. And all you can hope is that they do things that are consistent with what your objectives are. So a strategic plan is a way to convey, communicate to the rest of the people in the organization, where do I want to go? What are my objectives? What's my intent? And then as things change, and they always will, uh, you can, it provides a framework so you can announce your change in intentions or plans. You can explain to the rest of the people why things have changed, why you're changing your plan, based on the fact that you start out with a plan. I actually have students who come by two or three years after they've done their personal plan and talk about how they've just been reviewing it to see what they've done and accomplished, what didn't work out, and what things they want to change. So it's a reference point. It's a great way to remind yourself of what you really thought about doing and where you are at the present time. And of course, that leads to why you have an organizational vision, because it brings leadership to consensus on where the organization is going. A leadership can then communicate this to the rest of the organization. And it's a content for decision making. Uh, as things start to happen, you can look at the plan and decide whether uh, the decision you're going to make is consistent with your plan or contrary to your plan. And if you have a good reason for it being contrary to your plan, so be it. But at least you understand what you're doing. So strategic planning for organizations uh, takes leadership. Uh, a leader must first know thyself. Uh, they must understand what their objectives are and really what their values are. Then they must communicate openly and honestly with the rest of the group, which is often very difficult. And then, on top of that, they have to listen to the group and adjust the plan when necessary. Uh, strategic plans are very often about change, and people resist change even when they don't understand what the change is about. And so the leader must be prepared to strike a really fine balance they must listen to the individuals in the organization, understand why the resistance is there, and then decide which to respond to and which to ignore. And so they're always trying to decide how to manage their way through this very complex process. Okay, so now we've talked about organizations. Let's talk about applied to people. And I did some of this for the workshop that we had. This is the life expectancy in the United States uh, over the last 100 plus years. In 1900, it was 47. Uh, in 2014, it was 79. It's kind of an amazing difference. It's, uh, I haven't even tried to figure out what it's going to be in 2070. I mean, it's been enough to just look at the change in the, in the life expectancy of people in the United States uh, over the last uh, 100 plus years. So what does that mean uh, for people specifically? Uh, in the good old days, and I don't really believe in the good old days, I think we just forget the bad parts and then reminisce about the parts that we remember. But pre-1960, I'll say, 
Most people had one career, retired around 55, and sat in a rocking chair until they died around 60. Now, that's a slight exaggeration, I admit. But, but generally, uh, back in those days, in the 60s and before that, people tended to have one career, stay with one organization, and about 55 or 60, they kind of had insight they were going to retire, and really they generally didn't have plans for a second career uh, or hobby or other activities. Uh, now they may have one or two careers by 55 or even more and still have almost 30 years of life remaining. So that really leads to several questions, which I've kind of gotten my students to start focusing on in class. What are you going to do with the rest of your life, and how are you going to start preparing now? Now, to be clear, I don't believe that people have to always have a career, have a job, okay? Uh, but people, more or less, I'll just say this personal opinion, need some structure in their lives. Um, and it could be around hobbies. Uh, one of my friends was a, a scientist, uh, and when she retired, she became a flower show judge and a bird watcher, traveled all over the world. And those were her passions. Uh, somebody else I know uh, loved woodworking. So he went in his garage and created a woodworking shop, and that was what he did. Uh, there are other people who move from one career to another. I'm kind of in my third right now. Uh, and they find that that's the way to give themselves the structure in their lives uh, that they need. So whichever route you choose and whatever you decide to do, personal belief, being intellectually active, continue to be interested in things, is a way to kind of continue to live a fairly uh, healthy and successful life. As somebody said in the workshop that uh, I did, uh, health is kind of the first criteria. If you're healthy, then everything else is easy. Um, but beyond that point, uh, the question is, to what extent do you need structure? Um, and how do you create that structure one way or the other? And incidentally, all of this, which, you know, in some sense seems very simple and in other sense is profound, is just something I've kind of arrived at teaching all of these students and getting feedback from them uh, on what they're thinking and what they're experiencing. All pretty much structured common sense. So <clears throat> I've set up a series of guidelines for students uh, in the class uh, that I teach. Have a set of first principles or values. You have to know, first of all, uh, what's very important to you, uh, what you're willing to give up or not do, and which things you're very passionate about. So the first thing you better do is have a set of first principles. And you have to be, I would say, brutally honest about it. It's very difficult at times to do that introspective. It's kind of the who are you? Who are you really? Not who do you think you are and who does everybody else think you are, but deep down, what really drives you? So I push my students to come up with their set of first principles. Then they have to do personal benchmarking. Uh, they have to look at not only what they're doing, uh, but what people around them are doing. When I was planning to retire from my first career, uh, I went and talked to four or five people I knew, I was, very, I was friends with, who had already retired. I said, tell me what it's like. Tell me what you learned by doing it, uh, what mistakes you made. Um, and that was a very useful kind of exercise in preparing myself. Build networks. Talk to people who are in different kinds of careers or opportunities so you can find out exactly what they're doing and how do they like it. Utilize a coach. Uh, one of my best friends who has been my coach for a very long time has been a great sounding board. You know, periodically I, I will just sit down with him and start talking about what I'm thinking and where I'm going and, and just get whatever feedback I can. And, and of course, it doesn't mean I necessarily agree with the feedback or follow it, and there's sometimes I say, hell no, you know, I don't agree with that. But just having the ability to say that, think it, and understand what you like to do and what you don't is an important part of the process. Experiment and create test beds. One of my students said that they wanted to uh, start a small business, and I said, 
well, that's kind of hard. I've never done it, but my impression is it's not easy. And they said, well, I know. I'm working for free for a neighbor on the weekends in their small business uh, just to see uh, what it's like. Uh, an another person, uh, she wanted to start a bakery. Now, she was in law enforcement, and so she was going to start a bakery where her cupcakes uh, had cufflinks on them or <laughs> pistols or all sorts of different things like that. And I said, well, that's an interesting idea. Interesting, I always say is an interesting word. Um, but I said, uh, do you have any experience in that? And she said, well, I'm working in a bakery right now, uh, part-time, uh, for free, just to kind of get an idea. And so experiments are a great idea. You may discover that you don't like what you decided you wanted to do, uh, or you need particular training to do it that you don't have, uh, or it's perfect, that you're ready for it and you're prepared for it. And so uh, I heartily recommend experiments. Uh, lay out your own path. You know, you may decide you want to take a particular path and there are courses you could take that prepare you, or experiences you could have volunteering or working for someone. So there's lots of different ways uh, to lay out your own path and then do some of the steps to first decide whether you're really on the right path, and second, uh, to do some of the things to prepare you either for, uh, e even further. Uh, it's up to you. you know, you've got to do it. You can get help doing it. Um, I, I've often said, sometimes to the point that people don't want to hear it, that no decision is a decision. And so if you don't do anything about the future, well, it's going to happen one way or the other. The question is whether you'll be prepared to influence it. And so it's really up to you. And then finally, the plan is always subject to change. Uh, just like an organization's plan, you have to understand that the circumstances will change with time. And you just need to reflect on that and decide what to do. That doesn't negate the utility of making up a plan uh, because that's your reference point. That's where you were when you were thinking. And then as circumstances change, then you can decide whether you want to change or not. So I set my classes on a class exercise, Know Thyself. Uh, we did some of this in the workshop. Uh, then write down some thoughts, brainstorm on what you'll do in the second half of your life. Uh, what would you like to do? How might you prepare for it? And, and again, the ones that have been in the workshop saw exactly the way it works in the class. Everybody sits down, they start writing ideas. For some of them, it's the first time that they've ever sat down and thought about that. For others, they're already making plans. They know what they want to do. Um, then in my class, and, and we did it in the workshop, you sit down with others, and of course, you don't want the others to say, boy, that's a dumb idea, but you really want creative, constructive suggestions. Have you thought about this instead? Here's an experiment that perhaps you could do to test it out. And so you really want to get other people involved in the dialogue because they can give you some very constructive ideas. And then the last thing we did in the workshop was you write a 30-second elevator speech, and I had to do this as part of a an admiral's retirement course that I was lucky enough to take, and I had like three days to do it. And of course, in the workshop, we had like a half hour, 40 minutes. But the idea is you sit down and you, you're in an elevator. This is a scenario. Um, you're in the elevator with somebody who's well connected. They know people. They can connect you to people who have jobs. They know you're thinking about moving on. And so they say, so what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And the last thing you want to do is say, well, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. And so the idea in this exercise is to create a very brief, you're in an elevator now, 30-second elevator speech. This is what I've thought about doing. These are my objectives in the future. And so uh, as you saw in the workshop, you, you really get a good opportunity to think about how you're going to talk about your future uh, and then get feedback by listening to everybody else, to listen to all the different ideas that people have, all the aspirations that they have. And finally, in the class, <clears throat> after they've done that, one of their final projects is to build a personal strategic plan for the rest of their life. I give them several models, um, but it's up to them how they craft it. 
and then they all get up at the end and share their plans, which is, again, I, I firmly believe that students learn as much from each other as they do from the faculty, and in this case, they get to hear each other's hopes and aspirations and plans for the future. So having done this for five or six years and having probably four or 500 students, I decided I wonder if these exercises impact the students. I mean, I had you know, taught it to hundreds of students, uh, and I wanted to see uh, what impact it was having on them, uh, if any, uh, and how they came out of the exercise, and if I could change it, in other words, uh, to make it even better. So I surveyed 100, hundreds of students, about 500, I got about 80, 85 responses, which I thought was pretty good. And on the next chart, this is kind of what I found out by, by surveying the students. Uh, planning results in positive feelings about life and more likelihood of responding to opportunities. I mean, my theory about that is that when they start doing planning, no matter how complete it is, they feel less like a victim of circumstances. They feel like at least they've done something to think about and start to plan for the future. And, and so I believe that leads, well, they believe it le and said it led to positive feelings uh, about life in the future, and I believe that that makes them more receptive to opportunities that may fly by. And so, in, in general, I felt good that that actually was a positive effect. Uh, interesting to me was after planning, most students involved more people in development of their plans. I mean, I had students, and it kind of struck me as, I don't know, odd or humorous, maybe it shouldn't have, uh, but essentially said, gee, after this planning, I decided I was going to get my wife involved or my husband involved in the planning. And I thought, well, that's interesting, because um, they were essentially planning in a vacuum. Um, <laughs> And there are other people who decided that they were going to get some of their friends involved uh, or people at work that they trusted. And so just the idea uh, that they were going to open up to receiving more ideas, not, not so they could kind of mindlessly accept them, but because when people suggest things to you, they either sound good to you and you decide you're going to figure out how to incorporate them, or you really don't like them, but it's important to know you don't like them. Many of the students started with no plan. Now, I was dealing with two groups of students. I st still have kind of two groups, which I'll stereotype. Uh, one group is like 30-somethings, and one group is like 20-somethings. And the 30-somethings at least are starting to think about the future. Some of them have concrete plans. They already know exactly what they're going to do. Uh, others, well, they know they better start thinking about things, but they haven't figured out. The 20-somethings, it's very painful to watch. They just, they, they can't, most of them can't think beyond age 30, you know. Maybe they'll have children, maybe they'll be married, you know, and I say, you don't understand, you know, that's not the second half of your life. That's kind of the middle of the first half. And so for them to kind of get pushed, it's painful, and, and their plans are obviously often less complete, but at least a number of them start thinking about it, whereas they hadn't uh, before. Uh, the planning process uh, and course impacted most of the students one way or the other. Uh, some of them created a plan when they had none. Uh, others changed their plans or actually thought of specific actions they wanted to take coming out of the planning process and went and did something. And by and large, the planning development altered their view of planning. They kind of got a different perspective. Uh, I would say planning in general gets a bad rap. Um, a lot of planning is wonderful at the conceptual vision stage, and then the execution is terrible. Everybody gets exhausted and doesn't do anything. It's hard. You have to focus on it. You have to spend time on it. I'm too busy. Um, and so by and large, um, they started to appreciate that planning was valuable even if you didn't have a lot of follow through. So what have I learned by the survey and, and this experience of uh, teaching? 
Strategic planning is constructive for both people and organizations. Um, I think that, you know, by and large, there's a number of different approaches that tend to show how it's applied uh, to organizations, uh, maybe a little less so than people, or maybe it's applied almost as much, but it's not called strategic planning quite often when, when that happens. It's much more of a vector to measure and react to change than a plan cast in concrete. Um, it's really important to have that kind of view of the direction you're heading and understand, hey, every couple of years I ought to reassess where I am and what's happened and do I need to change that vector. So you really need to review the plan um, every few years and see where you are. And as I said, I've had students talk about, gee, they could check off things that they had actually accomplished, which made them feel really positive. And then they started to tweak the plan and decide to adjust exactly what they uh, were going to do. It can be used as a catalyst for change. Experiments are very healthy and important. And so a plan could and often does drive you to think about experiments you can do to test out different parts of the plan. It requires an open and honest dialogue and the opportunity for gestation. The who are you is often the hardest part. People do great in the SWAT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. They do great at strengths and opportunities. They don't do so well at weaknesses. Threats, I guess, sometimes they do well. Weaknesses, really hard. Half the time, what I see as weakness is, well, I tend to work too hard. You know, so, so having a real honest dialogue uh, is important. You also need an opportunity for gestation, for thinking. Uh, most of the successful processes I've been, been involved in have required months and opportunities to talk and argue among people and then go away and think about it and then come back. I had someone who came to me who liked the approach that was being used at the Applied Physics Lab and they were ordered by their admiral uh, to do the same thing in their organization. So I explained what we did and how doing it took six to nine months to come up with the first pass. And he said, oh, I don't have the time for that. He wants it in the next month. And I kind of laughed and said, good luck. Um, and that effort crashed because you just need time for people to adjust, to think. It's a culture thing. You're trying to change the culture. You don't do that overnight. And as I've said, many plans fall more in the, uh, fail more in the execution phase than in development. You develop a nice vision. You kind of get a good idea of where you want to go. And then you get exhausted and go back to your regular work and the plan kind of goes by the, by the way, wayside. Okay, well that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.